Welcome to another episode of Gary Talks. In the past, I've ranked sitcoms of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I thought about ranking sitcoms of like the 2000s, the 2010s, but really, based on the rules that I gave for my rankings, there weren't a lot of situational comedies made in the 2000s, 2010s, 2020s, and honestly, a lot of the ones that were made weren't really that good. What happened was, instead of your three-camera setup with a live audience on a studio stage, things were shot more like a movie or a reality show, and it became what we now call the single-camera comedy. So today, I'm going to rank my top ten single-camera comedies of all time. Gary. As I said, when I did my 70s, 80s, and 90s sitcom rules, basically I wanted it to be a three-camera setup on a studio set with a live audience or at least a laugh track. But for these single-camera comedies, the only rule is that it's a comedy and it's shot on a single camera. So it can be the mockumentary style or it can be just shot like a movie. Either one works, so this is really wide open. Now I know there actually were some single camera type comedies shot way a long time ago in the 50s, 60s, that kind of thing. But honestly, I haven't really watched a lot of those. I know of their existence, but they're not going to be part of this list. So this list really is just from, say, the mid-90s until now. So let's start with number 10, a show that aired on NBC that was probably better than anything else on the network at that time. And that show was The Good Place. As you'll see, a common theme that will carry through all of my favorite comedies is a great ensemble cast with lots of callbacks to running jokes. The Good Place is a prime example as our main six characters were all fully fledged characters that grew over time, and the show was filled with fun recurring characters for all four seasons. The Good Place had many more twists and turns than a typical comedy would. It began with Kristen Bell's character finding herself in heaven, and she is pretty sure she's there by mistake as she most certainly doesn't belong. We're going to get into a few spoilers here, but as the show goes on, it's revealed that she really does belong there, and not because she's a good person, but because this is really the bad place. Each season, more layers of the onion are revealed, and the show is strong all the way to the finale. The Good Place was created by Michael Schur, who also created other great single-camera comedies like Parks and Rec and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. But The Good Place stands heads and tails above those. And I have to admit, I'm a little biased, as I actually had a chance to visit The Good Place. And it was awesome. Next up is another show that aired on NBC, and it's kind of funny that NBC has so many really quality single-camera comedies. Especially back those of us that grew up in the 80s, NBC was the place for sitcoms. So I hadn't really thought about it until I started doing this video that NBC really was a home of really good single-camera comedies as well, because there's at least one more showing up later. But while I'm saying great things about NBC, I have to slam them a little bit too because this was a show that aired on NBC, they didn't appreciate it, I feel like they didn't really support it, and they canceled it far too early. And now, it's the kind of show that's completely forgotten about. No one talks about it, you don't really see it on DVD anywhere, and I believe it is streaming on Peacock now, but they don't really do anything to promote it, and it's really a shame. My number nine favorite single camera comedy, My Name is Earl. Jason Lee always brought a great slacker energy to his characters, most famously as Brody Bruce in Mallrats, as well as other appearances in the Viewisk universe. And he brought that same energy as Earl Hickey, a crook who wins the lottery and then loses his ticket after he's hit by a car. He finds out that this was most likely karma, so he makes a list of all the people he has wronged, and each episode of the show has Earl, along with his goofy brother Randy, doing his best to repay all the bad deeds by helping those people. It's a strangely heartwarming show while also being about as raunchy as possible on NBC. 
Like The Good Place, the show was filled with great supporting characters as well as many memorable recurring characters who all lived in this small town. Through no fault of their own, the show ended on a cliffhanger and we never got to see Earl finish his list. Creator Greg Garcia had a little fun with this in the pilot for his next show, Raising Hope, as a television newscaster says something along the lines of, A small-time crook, with a long list of wrongs he was making amends for, has finally finished, and you'll never guess how it ended. And then the TV gets turned off. Greg has since revealed that how he wanted to end the show was Earl realizing that all the people he helped along the way made their own list to help people, and that he had done far more good in his life than bad. So he tears up the list and walks off into the sunset a happy man. That would have been great. Thanks, NBC, for screwing us out of that one. From a show that has kind of disappeared from conversation because the show itself disappeared, to a show that has disappeared from conversation because now it doesn't fit into the modern sensibility of what comedy is. It's a show that was not diverse. It's a show that didn't have strong female characters. It's a show where rich white people had a lot of fun. And now, that's just not funny, apparently. But to me it is. It's a show I still love, and I don't care if people hate it. That show is Entourage. <laughs> Entourage was created by Doug Ellen and was loosely based on the experiences of actor Mark Wahlberg and his group of friends, including his own experiences as an up-and-coming actor in Hollywood. The series follows the life of Vincent Chase, a young actor from Queens, New York, as he navigates the highs and lows of the entertainment industry in Los Angeles. Vincent is supported by his childhood friends from Queens, Eric, E, Murphy, and Turtle, as well as his brother Johnny Drama, who had one hit series a long time ago, as well as his agent Ari Gold, played to perfection by Jeremy Piven. I've always been a sucker for TV shows and movies about the TV and movie industry, and Honorage did a great job with many stars showing up as themselves, which always made the show feel more real. One of the great things about Honorage was that it gave all the main characters plenty to do as well as growth, which made me change my mind often on who was my favorite. Sorry, that, that's a lie. Johnny Drama was always my favorite character, and it was great in the follow-up movies that he finally found success. Not that you'd know it now, but Honorage was a critical darling and won numerous awards including several Emmys. But now, it's either just not talked about, or if it is, it's about how degrading the show is to women. Get over yourself. It's a show of its time, and believe it or not, I'm pretty sure that rich and famous good-looking guys probably did have girls throwing themselves at him night after night. And I'm sorry that Honorage didn't have any strong female characters for your daughters to identify with. But then again, maybe they shouldn't be watching Honorage, and I'm sorry that Vincent Chase only had white friends. He didn't go down a checklist to make sure that his friends were diverse for everyone. I'm sure there are plenty of other shows that easily offended people can watch, but me, I'll rewatch Honorage. And to me, there is only one Aquaman. Sorry Jason Momoa, but it's Vinny Chase. So if NBC was a really great home for some of these single-camera comedies, an even better home was HBO. HBO was perfect for this kind of thing because you could be funny and crude and have cursing or nudity or whatever and you weren't constrained to the confines of regular network television. So of course, this is the kind of thing that helps shows like The Sopranos, The Wire, Six Feet Under, really get out there and expand audiences and do more with what television, which helped lead to what we call peak TV. But HBO was able to do this with comedies as well. We had Honorage already. Trust me, there will be a couple more HBO shows coming up too. But the kind of HBO show that really started it all in the mid-90s, brought single camera comedies back, as well as pulled back the curtain and showed what it's like to work on a TV show set in Hollywood. It's a great show. I wish more people talked about it now. It's one that, again, has kind of been forgotten. But to me, it's amazing. My number seven favorite single camera comedy of all time? Hey Now! It's The Larry Sanders Show. Remember how I said that one of the reasons I loved Honorage was the behind-the-scenes feel we got of Hollywood? Now triple that for The Larry Sanders Show. And it did it first. 
It was probably the first show I remember seeing where celebrities played fictional versions of themselves, and it really blew me away as a teenager. The Larry Sanders Show satirized the world of late-night talk shows and the entertainment industry as a whole. It provided a behind-the-scenes look at the fictional late-night talk show hosted by Larry Sanders, played by Gary Shandling, showcasing the egos, politics, and insecurities involved in producing such a show. Jeffrey Tambor played Hank, hey now, Kingsley, Larry's sidekick on the show. But the show was stolen by Rip Torn as Larry's producer Artie. Holy shit, did he make every line hilarious. The Larry Sanders show had super smart writing and was literally a laugh a minute, if not more. From a technical standpoint, the show mixed film and videotape to highlight what we were seeing that was on the TV show and what we were seeing that was behind the scenes or in real life. And if you wonder why some of the writing was so sharp, Judd Apatow was one of the main writers on the show. If it's one you haven't seen, be sure to watch it. And even now, 25 years later, it still holds up. Coming in at number six is a show that this might be the one that causes a lot of disagreements with you guys that, that watch these lists and like to talk to me. You know, this is what you think, what I did wrong, what I did right, what you agree with. I think this is going to be the show that everyone is going to either agree with me for ranking it here, disagree with me for having it on the list at all. Uh, you know, it's the kind of thing if the show had ended earlier, it would be higher on the list, but it did go on a couple seasons too long. But still, for my money, it is the best of the mockumentary shows, and that is The Office. Obviously, I'm talking about the U.S. version of The Office. While I liked the British version okay, I thought once the American version found its footing, it was far and away better. And like the other shows on this list, it's all to do with the ensemble cast. The characters from The Office have become iconic, from the bumbling yet lovable Michael Scott to the sarcastic and deadpan Jim Halpert. The show is filled with unforgettable characters. You'll find yourself rooting for some, laughing at others, and maybe even relating to a few. The Office has a wide range of humor, from subtle jokes to over-the-top gags. Whether you enjoy witty banter, cringe comedy, or slapstick humor, there's something in it for everyone. And the middle of it all, there was a lot of heart and friendship. There are so many memorable lines from The Office that have made it into the lexicon. Most famously, that's what she said which I probably still say three times a day. But yes, the show did go on too long. I kind of think it should have ended with Jim and Pam's wedding, and it would have been a perfect show, but then we wouldn't have seen the greatest episode of The Office, Threat Level Midnight. We've searched the whole building, Golden Face. Where is the bomb? Hmm? We've searched the whole building, Golden Face. Where is the bomb? Hmm? We've searched the... Okay. So at the very least, the show should have ended when Michael Scott left. But it went on two more seasons, which does hurt the overall show, but it also was nowhere near a show that I'd say shit the bed. There is another episode of Gary Talks where I outline 10 shows that shit the bed, but The Office isn't one of them. The Office was one of the first mockumentary TV shows that was done like a reality show, and while that became overdone and cliche, it was perfect on this show, and from what I've heard, there will now be a spin-off that is about the documentary crew, which could very well be awesome. Will it be better than The Office? In the words of Dwight K. Schrute, False. We're back to HBO again for another one of my favorite single camera comedies. And you guys that have watched this show know that I love Danny McBride. He has been in some amazing single camera comedies all for HBO. You got The Righteous Gemstones, which is still going and is just brilliant and funny. Before that, you had the very underrated Vice Principals, also starring Walton Goggins. But for my money, the best of the Danny McBride HBO single camera comedies was the first one he did for them. And that is Eastbound and Down. I'm sick and tired of carrying all the weight. Uh, the coaches and owners not give me the shit I need to win. Atlanta, you're fucking out. Eastbound and Down follows Kenny Powers, a former professional baseball pitcher whose self-destructive behavior leads to his downfall and his attempts to make a comeback in the world of baseball and navigate his personal and professional life in his hometown of Shelby, North Carolina. Eastbound and Down is known for its over-the-top humor, often exploring themes of masculinity, fame, and redemption through absurd and outrageous situations. 
Danny McBride's portrayal of the brash and egotistical Kenny Powers is a comedic tour de force. While Kenny Powers may seem like a caricature of a washed-up athlete, the show delves into his psyche, exploring his insecurities, vulnerabilities, and ultimately, his humanity. Despite his flaws, Kenny is a complex and multi-dimensional character whose journey resonates with viewers. In the words of poet Kid Rock, I'm not straight out of Compton, I'm straight out the trailer. And a show like Eastbound and Down really plays into everything that I remember about growing up around rednecks, as it's set in North Carolina and captures the quirks and idiosyncrasies of Southern culture. The show immerses viewers in its Southern charm while simultaneously subverting stereotypes. In addition to Danny McBride's standout performance as Kenny Powers, the show features a talented ensemble cast, including Steve Little as Kenny's loyal but dim-witted friend Stevie, Katie Mixon as Kenny's former high school sweetheart April, and the super-talented John Hawks as Kenny's brother Dustin. Eastbound and Down boasts a distinctive visual style and direction with its use of handheld camera work, stylized editing, and atmospheric music contributing to the overall aesthetic. The show's cinematography enhances its comedic and dramatic moments, creating a unique viewing experience. Overall, Eastbound and Down is a darkly comedic and often irreverent exploration of fame, failure, and the pursuit of redemption. With its characters, the sharp writing, the boundary-pushing humor, the series has earned a dedicated fan base and cemented its status as a cult classic in television comedy. So far, it's been all NBC and HBO for these single camera comedies. So now let's step into basic cable. It was a show that aired on FX originally and then moved over to FXX, I believe. And no matter where it goes, people will follow it. The cast has all gone on to much bigger things, not better things, but bigger things. They're all very busy, so it takes a while for a new season to be made. But every time it is, we all show up at the TV sets, on the internet, on your phone, if that's how you watch TV, and we join in for another new season. It's not as good as it used to be, but still, it's one of the best single camera comedies of all time. Number four, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia has been going for damn near 20 years and is probably the darkest comedy on my list. And I love dark, dark comedy. The show revolves around a group of five friends who own and operate an Irish bar called Patty's Pub in Philadelphia. Each character is deeply, deeply flawed, selfish, and morally questionable in their own way, which sets the stage for absurd and often outrageous situations. Through the years, I've related differently to each character. When the show first came out, I saw myself as more of a Charlie, a, an innocent guy who just wants to have fun with his friends and probably a little bit silly. Then I became more of a Mac, especially in the Fat Mac years. But now I realize I'm Dennis. I'm annoyed by pretty much 95% of everything and feel like it's not gonna take much to make me snap. I feel like a broken record. Kids, you can ask an old person to explain that. But again, this is a show where the ensemble all carry the show equally, and the recurring cast of crazy characters makes the world feel real and lived in. It's Always Sunny is known for its edgy and boundary-pushing humor. It fearlessly tackles taboo subjects such as addiction, mental illness, racism, and sexuality, often using satire to critique social norms and conventions. It's Always Sunny has developed a dedicated cult following over the years, with fans embracing the dark humor and the characters. Its influence can be seen in other comedies and its impact on internet culture, with fans creating memes and fan theories around the show's lore. Overall, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia wasn't afraid to push the boundaries and challenge the audience. It had that unique blend of dark humor, satire, and characters that has solidified its place as one of the most beloved and enduring sitcoms of its generation. Now, I love shows 10 through 4 on my list. They wouldn't be on this list if I didn't love them. But there's something about my top three shows that is very special to me. All three of these are heads and tails better than the others. And yeah, I watch the others over and over again. The others always make me laugh. But these three move closer to a level of perfection. Number one, purely perfect. Number two, 99% perfect. 
Number three is about 92.5% perfect. There was, you know, a season in there that wasn't that good, but still, these top three shows are in my favorite shows of all time, regardless of genre. And we'll start with number three, as we're back again to a single camera comedy on NBC, Community. Community was created by Dan Harmon and aired for six seasons. The show gained a dedicated cult following for its unique blend of humor, pop culture references, and meta-commentary. Community is set at the fictional Greendale Community College and follows a diverse group of students who form an unlikely bond while attending classes together. The main character, Jeff Winger, is a disbarred lawyer who enrolls in Greendale after his credentials are questioned. He forms a study group with other students including the earnest and awkward Annie Edison, the pop culture savvy Abed Nadir, the outspoken and politically active Britta Perry, the lovably naive Troy Barnes, the mature and sarcastic Shirley Bennett, and the eccentric millionaire Pierce Hawthorne, played by the comedy genius Chevy Chase. Yeah, I get that he's supposed to be a horrible prick to work with and the entire cast and crew hated him, but for my money, he has the biggest laughs and the show certainly suffered when he was written out. Throughout the series, the group navigates various misadventures ranging from absurd paintball wars to elaborate heists, all while dealing with personal growth and relationships. The show is known for its inventive storytelling, often breaking the fourth wall and experimenting with different genres and narrative styles. Community also had that strong supporting cast, including the eccentric Dean Pelton, who is obsessed with Greendale's image, and Ben Chang, a former Spanish teacher turned megalomaniacal villain. The show's meta-humor and clever writing have earned it a place in television history as a true cult classic. And it looks like Dan Harmon's promise of six seasons and a movie is actually happening, as the community movie has been greenlit. It's time to head back to Greendale one more time. Coming in at number two is the best single-camera comedy to ever air on HBO. And there have been a lot. Even beyond the ones on my list or ones I've talked about, HBO has done a great job of supporting single-camera comedies. But the one that's the top that I don't think can ever be beaten because it is just amazing, it is the perfect version of an HBO single-camera comedy. It's Curb Your Enthusiasm. Curb Your Enthusiasm was of course created by Larry David, where he stars as, well, he claims a fictionalized version of himself, but I think we all know we are seeing the real Larry David. Curb Your Enthusiasm was what is known as a scripted improv show, as there would be a skeleton of a script, but a lot of what we saw on screen was all improvisation, which thanks to the super talented cast and guest stars, is a true comedic masterpiece. That stellar cast includes Jeff Garland, Susie Essman, the late great Richard Lewis, and of course, my absolute favorite, J.B. Smoove as Leon Black. My name is Cheppy Johnson and I can't open this damn pickle jar! Curb Your Enthusiasm is known for pushing the boundaries of comedy, tackling controversial topics and social taboos in a way that is both thought-provoking and hilarious. Larry is often depicted as neurotic, socially awkward, and prone to getting himself into embarrassing situations. The humor of the show stems from Larry's unfiltered honesty, his inability to navigate society, and his tendency to speak his mind regardless of the consequences. The show has been praised for its fearlessness in addressing sensitive issues, making it a must-watch for anyone who appreciates bold and boundary-pushing humor. The show just had its final season, and much like Kiss, he has said it before, but this time I'm thinking that it just might really stick, and we won't get any more Curb Your Enthusiasm. If this is the case, the show ends as my number two single camera comedy of all time, and in the immortal words of Larry David himself, Pretty! Pretty! Pretty, pretty good! And now for number one. Is it going to be an NBC show? Is it going to be an HBO show? Well, I already said that Curb was the best HBO single camera comedy, so is it going to be one from NBC? No, it's one that was on Fox and also on Netflix. But we're just gonna talk about, really, the Fox portion. Yeah, I know, shows like The Office, I took down a couple notches because it went on too long or later seasons weren't as good. But with my number one show, 
the first three seasons were perfect. I almost just prefer to pretend that those last ones for Netflix didn't happen. It is the best single camera comedy of all time. Number one for me is Arrested Development. Arrested Development follows the dysfunctional Bluth family, a wealthy yet deeply flawed clan living in Orange County, California. The patriarch, George Bluth Sr., played by Jeffrey Tambor, is arrested for white-collar crime, leaving his son Michael Bluth, played to perfection by Jason Bateman, to take over the family business and care for his eccentric relatives. Arrested Development is known for its clever wordplay, running gags, and intricate plot lines, often featuring callbacks and foreshadowing across episodes and seasons. Despite critical acclaim and a dedicated fan base, Arrested Development struggled with low ratings during its original run on Fox, leading to its cancellation after three seasons in 2006. However, the show's cult status continued to grow in the years following its cancellation, leading to that revival, which was ambitious, but ultimately wasn't very good. The thing that sets Arrested Development apart from all the other shows on this list is you can watch it for the second, third, fourth, or fifth time, and you will still catch things and little performances you might have missed before. You get this a lot with the best of the best of TV dramas like Breaking Bad, The Sopranos, or The Wire, but you don't see it a lot from a comedy show, which is why to me, Arrested Development is the greatest single camera comedy ever made. There you go, my top 10 single camera comedies of all time. What do you guys think? Should The Office even be on here? Should something be higher than Curb Your Enthusiasm? Is that the number one show? Should the Netflix episodes of Arrested Development have taken it down? Send me a message, let me know. And as always, you guys should check out GaryTalks.tv. That's the website, it has all the audio versions of these podcasts, as well as links to my Twitter, the Gary Talks Facebook page, which also, if you don't like the Gary Talks Facebook page already, you should like it because I do videos, rants, things like that exclusively for Facebook. So if you enjoy these, head over there, give it a like, and thank you guys for watching. Now, next week, I'm going to go back to film. And remember that time I did the episode on Quentin Tarantino as my favorite writer, director, filmmaker of all time? Well, I have another of my favorite writer, director, filmmakers coming up, but you'll have to tune in next Friday to see who it is. See you then.